What's good my fellow peasants? How are you all doing? I am going to wrap my way through this because we're going to be reviewing episode Ignis and there's a hell of a lot of uh, thoughts I want to get through and I don't want to take too much of your time in doing it. So episode Ignis. Woo. I usually wait a week before I review anything to let the hype die down a bit but episode Ignis I have to do it sooner. Uh, this was by far by far the best DLC and I'm going to say I'm not only just impressed I'm shocked impressed by Square Enix. This DLC was freaking incredible. From everything from the story, the action, the drama, the feels. I mean, it was only a two to three hour experience and I felt like in that DLC alone, I went through an entire journey. The new mechanics of the combat system were sick and in terms of what they achieved cutscene and terrain wise, what they built, by far Episode Ignis was the most technically impressive. There were destructible regions, all of the carnage and variety and detail that they threw into Alticia, even showing us entire new parts of the city we had never seen. Any new games coming out of Square Enix using this engine, shit, count me in. But enough blowing sunshine and rainbow up the arse of episode Ignis. Uh, let's talk about what happened. Um, because this is, it's splitting the fan base. It's splitting people. So there was a happy ending, a happy alternative ending that honestly has had a load of fans saying this is the better ending. This should have been the ending. I prefer this ending. This is now my headcanon ending. And then there's some people who are saying that they don't like it because not only does it fuck with the canonicity uh, or at least it, causes pe it makes people argue about the canonicity. It also undermines all of the tragedy, the sacrifice that the original game completely centered around. And this alternative ending, it kind of undermines that Ignis doesn't go blind, Noctus doesn't have to kill himself, uh, Ravus doesn't even die. All pretty damn significant changes. And you no, know, whichever side of the fence you fall on is perfectly down to you. But what I wanted to discuss is canonicity. So I don't think we've had any news out for Tabata. By the time that I get this video out, maybe Tabata has made a comment on it. But all I can say is the canon, it's, it's not so clear cut. I see some people saying it's not canon. I see some people saying it is. Uh, and I, I understand the argument of both. I'm going to chip in with my thoughts. So the first thing I would say towards why it is canon is because in my mind, this all alternate version of the story is an alternate timeline. It's an alternate reality. And being that alternate realities and timelines have been confirmed as being canonical in FF15. So Tabitha came out and confirmed that Omen was a real reality. It was just an alternate reality. It's an ATR event when they post up the timeline to show to fans the timeline of 15 where everything fitted in. There was a specific section for alternate realities. Now, whether this is some of the remnants of Fabula Nova Crystallis, a bit of the FNC lore creeping back through them, in which timelines and repeating timelines was a major theme. And therefore, I would like to say all of these uh, situations are canon. And yes, I'm going to talk about the theory I did because I've had people posting me it. And the second I played it, uh, played episode Ignis, it linked in with the huge theory that I had that Regis is the one who's creating these ultimate timelines and cycles. Now, for anyone who hasn't seen it, I'll quickly recap. Basically, the idea is that Regis, in also finding out that his son uh, has to be sacrificed the same way Ignis did in this episode, which was another huge point we found out that Ignis knew all the way back as far as chapter to 10. Uh, but Regis learned it in the Omen trailer. It was confirmed that the voice in the crystal saying he only needed one more sacrifice was Ardin. So in learning this, what Regis did to a basically bent heaven and earth to ensure that his son would have a future and he created the carbuncle figurine which created a stitch in time that would repeat the time cycles until such time as, as Noctis succeeded. Now there's a whole load of points to uh, this theory but the main thing is that this was shown in the Omen trailer and during the car pushing scene Gladiolus makes a very distinct hint at I hope this isn't some sort of Omen and that's the start of the game and we see that car pushing scene repeat itself at the end of the game which was very oddly placed in there it implies that maybe the timeline reset itself now looking at this DLC so to now see them coming out with a DLC uh, a version in which Noctus does survive and not only that just like the wedding scene in the original where uh, Regis was speaking uh, he does it again in this episode he speaks just before we see Noctus sat back on the throne and what he says uh, 
is what I believe ties in with the Omen trailer. It's the lines that a king always pushes forward accepting the consequences. Now when they put that in there, I thought that was a bit strange as I played it because it doesn't seem to at all tie in with what happened. In fact, Noctus did completely the opposite. He didn't accept the consequences. That was the whole point. Ignis tries to sacrifice himself instead or in the stead of Noctus. Uh, and upon seeing his bro dying, he refuses to accept the consequences anymore. He refuses to accept that a blood price must be paid to save the world. But just like Noctus didn't accept the consequences, by my theory stands at least as well, neither did Regis, because that's a young Regis saying about accepting the consequences. It's older Regis who, after finding out his someone's gonna have to sacrifice himself, he walks out, he looks to the heaven, and he asks for forgiveness. Now, it's always quite obscure what he was asking for forgiveness for, but could it be because his mantra 10 to 15 years ago when he was younger was that a king should always look forward accepting the consequences well he's contradicting his mantra even if he didn't create a time stitch and that theory is a flunk uh, even just by sending the bros along the reason he did that was to directly contradict what he saw in the omen trailer where it was not just traveling alone so he was basically contradicting what he himself said a king should do so Again, we don't really have enough to go on to be definitive either way, but I'd really like to see this going forward. An explanation on why alternate realities and timelines are a thing in this game. I feel that at the point it was just an omen trailer. It wasn't that big a deal. Like We didn't really need to know whether alternate realities, but I, I feel like now this episode Ignis, which gives an entirely different ending that loads of fans are now saying they're going to make their new head canon. Um, I feel like we need to know why these alternate realities and timelines are there. What is the canonicity of it, Tabitha? Because on the flip side, so now the reason why I understand why some people are saying this isn't canon is the main reason I can think is because Tabitha did say this wouldn't change the overall story of the game. Different conclusions and even specified such as non-canonical stories. So it would seem like that's pretty much the argument of canonicity done and dusted, boom. Uh, but it's kind of weird because the same kind of thing was said for Type Zero that had a totally alternate happy ending, but that was considered non-canonical, even though technically that reality did exist it did actually happen it's just part of a greater alternate timeline plot cycle either way let's actually dig into what happened in episode ignis so we found out how prina died kind of a confirmation that she was spirit linked uh, to luna although saying that she did come staggering from the era that arden was so maybe arden did directly kill her so again that whole theory that perhaps this is a way of arden eliminating shiva for good if my theory that shiva can inhabit her messengers is a thing you guys get on saying that was another theory so Ravus comes in we see his redemption holy crap did my heart bleed for Ravus uh, he was one of those characters where coming out of the main game he had such a different character from Kingsglaive and he was so poorly fleshed out that he was a disappointment as a character I wanted to know him but I've got to say after chapter 13 and after seeing Ravus's oh my god the hardships, the plight, the voice acting. Um, so that was an episode feels. So I loved Ravus, loved seeing 10 years older version of him. Uh, but Iggy, he puts on the ring to fight Arden. So at this point, this is canonical. The reason why Ignis went blind was so that he could fight Arden. Noctus wasn't the first one. And in the version of the game that we know, um, Ignis, he decided to defy Arden, uh, stand his ground, and that led to the events of FF15 as we know it. But if we decided to play along if Ignis had decided to play along it seems the events would have completely changed and the reason why I think is pretty clear because by playing along Arden takes him to his Ignortus keep he tells him that it's Arden loses Caelum really awesome part of that was they finally told us who the betrayer was if only no that would be my dear brother who snatched the throne and cast me into exile was in fact a brother. Whether his name was Izunia, still not confirmed, but Arden was betrayed by a brother. In wanting revenge, he used the Star Scourge. Maybe it's a case that after he was betrayed for the position of king by his brother, he used his Star Scourge revenge, and that's what lost him favor of the gods. Although where the Star Scourge come from is also kind of up in the air more than ever now, because originally we were told that Ifrit destroyed Solheim, and then we were told that Solheim was destroyed, wiped out by a plague so the Star Scourge, and then it was from the ashes of Solheim that Lucius Accordo Niflheim rose from the ashes. So it kind of made it seem like Ifrit bought the Star Scourge 
uh, down upon Solheim, and there was always rumours back in the day that it was going to originate from the moon, and then we kind of saw Pityos, which with Black Goo right leading up the stairs made it seem like it might have come from Pityos, and you know they've got Ifrit statues throughout Pityos, getting deeper and deeper, and it's even the amount of artwork. So it made it seem like Ifrit bought the Star Scourge, but with the way the story sounds now, it sounds like Arden was the one who was first infected, and then infected Ifrit. That's what they said in the backstory. So I'm really still unclear on that. If anyone's got any kind of clarification or they've muddled through it in their head. I feel like the story's been slightly tweaked and that's why it comes across as confusing, but they explain some more of that in episode Iggy and the voice that was doing it. Feeding on the dusk and embracing the darkness, he spurned the dawn, affecting a life untouched by time. Mm, now who was this voice? There's only a few candidates that I can think of. The first thing I'm going to explain is why if it is one of the gods, the gods of this world, which is most likely, uh, why Ignis is able to hear them. We've been told throughout this game that humans can't uh, communicate with gods and vice versa, gods can't with humans. But the reason why it could be Shiva slash Gentiana who is doing this speaking, one of the candidates I'm going to put forward is because of Prina. Prina is the one who is allowing Ignis to have these premonitions. It's the same as the Omen trailer. Prina was the one who was leading that and yet Regis was able to see it even Noctus himself had a dream of the Omen trailer and now it's happening once again in episode Ignis so I think that's the significance of Brina's character whereas Umbra can control time within that specific reality uh, allows Noctus to travel to the future Lucius past Lucius Brina's ability seems to extend beyond just that singular timeline and more into visions and premonitions of uh, other timelines or eventualities slash outcomes and this is pretty significant because Prina is a messenger and messengers allow gods and man to communicate and as Prina seems to have chosen Ignis here, uh, it's plausible why he'd be able to hear the voice of a god. Also, as the voice is coming from the crystal itself, uh, the same way that Noctis was able to hear Bahamut when he was in the crystal, no reason it can't work here as well. Now, this is getting debated on forums. Holy crap, they just broke my mic. Uh, this is getting debated on forums. Who was the mysterious voice? I think the bigger question here is, why did Square call it a mysterious voice? You know, one of the obvious picks we could go here is Shiva slash Gentiana. She's one of the candidates I've heard. A lot of people say that they thought she was speaking, but I'm going to say it doesn't sound like her. We've heard Shiva's voice in both normal and mysterious, fuzzy, blurred out warbling, and it doesn't sound like anything we've heard although the candidate that is her could be likely being a Shiva is trying to change events she is the one who is most active in trying to help to save the world so the fact that it could be her voice and forming Ignis because he plays such an integral role in Noctis's ascension and because she has what appears to be a kind of liking for him uh, I could see why she would be the one who was aiding Ignis in creating eventuality where Noctis got to live but there's also the fact that Umbra and Prina are the ones who are doing this time manipulation and control uh, being as they're her messengers it would me seem like it might be Gentiana and Shiva but I kind of just don't feel it the second candidate that I've seen everyone suggesting is it's Luna it's Luna it would tie in with what happened in episode Ignis where they specifically showed us that the Oracle work uh, isn't done at death and we saw the uh, spirit version of Luna and it makes a boat ton of sense when you think that this is the version where Noctus gets to live was Luna doing this as a gift to Noctus out of her love for him yada yada but the reason I don't like this either is because again why make it mysterious? Maybe Square are trying to hide from us that a Luna ascended to something way higher than just a dead oracle. Maybe she ascended to being a part of the crystal, maybe some sort of goddess herself. Maybe that's what we're going to see in episode Luna, which Tabitha did tease. But it's the way she's speaking. It's kind of a bit too cryptic. It doesn't sound like Luna. It's a completely different speech pattern, though I have heard some people say in the forums that supposedly, although it's not clear, uh, the voice actresses for Luna in certain languages were credited for this though how they know what the voice actor was being credited specifically for that mysterious voice line uh i don't know i'm just gonna roll out the one that i want to suggest and i know that a load of people have been thinking it as well let's talk about eos for fuck's sake let's talk about eos the gorn the gorn goddess <laughs> the gorn goddess the dawn goddess that a lot of people say she doesn't exist she doesn't exist she's not a thing anymore she's not a goddess um she didn't appear in any of the backstory of the summons that recently came out and we've never actually heard her reference specifically 
as being one of these gods in any of these backstories. So I see why a lot of people have said, I don't believe she is a goddess. She's just figurative. She's figurative for the Dawn Pairs, kind of like Mother Nature. Now, none of this really matters if Tabitha and Square Enix don't plan to really do anything with the Eos story arc. But at this point, I'm going to say if this voice is Eos, then in my opinion, there's more evidence at this stage to say she is a goddess than she isn't. For starters, she has a name in which the world is named after her. Secondly, she has an actual imagery. See in Insomnia, we see it on the wall. And now if this mysterious voice is her, if she is supposed to be representing the crystal, which it kind of implies it is. After all, Noctus directly spoke to the crystal when he wanted to save Ignis. He spoke to it, it answered his pleas. So it has a voice, it has a consciousness. So with a name, an actual physical depiction, some hints of a historical involvement, and now an actual voice and consciousness, I think there is enough there to at least speculate that she is still a goddess, or at least in my opinion, a shitload more than just people who say nah. And maybe with episode Arden coming 2018 and two other DLCs, there's a hell of a lot of opportunity for us to find out definitively who this voice was. After all, you don't just put a mysterious voice in, leave it open-ended for nothing. Although, saying that, this is Square Enix. Have, have I learned nothing in the last 18 months? <laughs> Getting into the grit of it now, so if Ignis decided to sacrifice his life and go toe to toe with Man Ardin, um, now there were a few options here and the one that I didn't see during the live stream is if you give up, Ardid admits that he nearly felt the chill wind of death, but that he's an immortal and can't be killed. The point is he admits Ignis almost brought him close to death. Now if you do this sacrifice route, which is a wholly terrible thing to have made us do, Square. Um, if you sacrifice Ignis's life, you almost destroy him, but not fully. Uh, not just comes in, they heal. And then you have the credits. Now, what I think was the significance of the alternate ending is that by playing along, Ignis was able to learn about Arden's skill set, about his moves, about his abilities, about his powers, about who he was, although in both versions we find that he's Arden Lucius Calum. And we could even argue that he weakened him in that fight. Bros, they go to all of the significant characters in the game, so Aranea, the best demon slayer, Viv, Sanya, Corleone, Sid, the whole lot of them. And even Ravus. Even Ravus is there to hand him the King's Sword directly. Now what you also notice in this scene when the bros decide to walk up the stairs, the lights are back on in Lucis. Now I haven't fi finished Comrades yet. You know, in Comrades, our mission is to bring the light back to Lucis. So whatever it is, in this alternate version, it seems like they prepared enough. The lights were on. They went into the uh, tower and then the dawn comes back. We didn't actually see what happened to Ardin. Maybe they're going to show that in an episode Ardin. Maybe they've left that open for some reason. Or maybe we're just supposed to assume that he got killed. But do we know that Ardin is destroyed for good? Was what all the gods and the Lucy are saying and kept reaffirming that the blood price had to be paid for his destruction, were they just wrong? Is there a chance that Arden could return? Uh, it's another mystery that's left semi-open-ended. You can make some sort of logical speculations towards how it went down, but there's nothing definitive in it. And the fact that there's also that mystery voice, I don't know if the fact that they're still leaving some open-ended answers, um, or questions should I say there, that they're teeing up something for episode Arden. And on that note, I'm quickly going to interrupt this video to announce that in today's news, just a few hours ago at the point I'm recording this, Tabata has teased a new gameplay experience for Final Fantasy XV. And it just says that in this uh, issue of Gaming Former, director Tabata has said that something else would be coming alongside new story content. Quote, there is also one other thing, a completely new gameplay experience I want to provide to players of 15 as well. I can't tell you what it is yet though, we're currently thrashing through the plans for that and getting into shape so we can announce exactly what it is at the beginning of the year. Wow, and it seems like whatever this is, this is no joke because they even said they've had plans for this for quite a while and this is how we're going to bring the game to an end. We call it the end of the journey, the end of our journey. Again, it's a project that we've come all the way from the beginning alongside our fans and we want to bring it to an end together with those fans. Slather me in it, Tabata. So something that's going to bring the story to an end. That's huge to hear. Maybe it's something to do with Arden, the backstory of the uh, Star Scourge. Maybe it's something that finally uh, pieces together what the hell are these alternate timelines about, these alternate versions of the story. Now, I know that there's going to be some people in the chat who are just talking up to Pez, you're overthinking it. They just threw in a happy ending so that people who were not happy with the sad ending and Iggy going blind and they can't deal with tragic dark ending 
endings or they just generally didn't like the way it was told. They were, they were just throwing that in there to please some fans. But I hope it's more than that. I hope it wasn't just some empty, hollow, meaningless no fan service fan fiction of an ending that they just slapped in there <laughs> i'm done guys i'm out that's just some very off the cuff ramblings on what i thought about episode ignorance gripping engaging insanely emotional cinematics the voice acting was through the roof those chases with caligo the boat scenes with titan wrecking the fuck out of ships oh it was so awesome in fact i'm gonna go play it now but let me know what you guys think what did you think of the dlc is there anything i missed that you thought was of significance in episode ignis let me know in the comment section below iggy is best bro till the next video Koopo!